There's going to be four parts to the presentation today. We're going to start and end with a section about market strategy. We're going to start by reviewing what we were saying one year ago and see how we did. And we're going to end with our market strategy and key themes for the rest of this year. In the middle of that, we've got two other sections, the traditional market recap that we do every quarter that lets you know how we finished up the last 90 days of 2023. And then what I consider to be the most interesting part of the presentation, the market outlook. The headline there is exceeding our limits. And we're gonna explore a number of ways that the economy and society are exceeding limits uh, and in fact, we're going to talk about it in terms of what we might call a gap analysis. So I'm really looking forward to getting into some of those details. So let's go ahead and jump into the first part of the presentation. And the four key investment themes for 2023 that we were talking about 12 months ago. And uh, before we actually re remind you of what those key themes were, let's take a look at what we'll call the consensus estimates for how the market would do versus how it actually did. And on this slide, what you'll see is the median projection across all the market strategists, economists, folks that uh, the, the fund firm Avantis was able to survey a year ago. And they've been doing this for many years, as you can see. And what they thought was the median or middle forecast for the S&P 500, which is most of the U.S. market. And that median forecast was for a return of 6.8%. Now, you may remember a year ago that I, I think I said in most forums that I don't know if I've ever been more excited to be a stock market investor than I was at the beginning of 2023. And in fact, the S&P 500 was up 24.2%. Now, looking back over the track record that Avantis is reminding us of here, and you may sense this if you regularly tune into CNBC or Bloomberg or, or Fox Business. But the year before that, in 2022, we were very cautious. We were very worried. We saw that the Federal Reserve was going to have to play a lot of catch up in raising rates. Um, the, the median forecast for the S&P 500 was only 1.2%, and yet that index was down 19.4%. And you can just see how dismal this industry is at trying to tell you what the markets are going to give you. So uh, we've we've been neutral for much of my time at BIP Wealth, but starting in 2021, we were extremely optimistic because some of the government policies were just so extreme. We got very cautious in 2022 and warned you of rough waters ahead. Then we flipped back to optimistic at the beginning of 2023. So our last three years, the only three years where we've really been directional at all, in terms of suggesting what the markets might give you, have had us uh, finding ourselves being spot on with those predictions. So we're pretty happy about that. Uh, it's a dangerous game to play, as you can see, and perhaps uh, overall uh, what this industry attempts to tell you could be uh, maybe the opposite of what you should actually expect. Looking at how the global index actually performed in 2023, there were some ups and there were some downs. 90 days ago, we we referred to our, our, our current position as, as just a bit of a pause, but suggested uh, not to worry that we still thought we would finish 2023 pretty strong. And that's exactly what happened. There were all sorts of what I might even call distracting headlines throughout 2023. And of course, we began with the dire warnings of what really was positioned as an, an, imminent, an imminent recession, just uh, as if it were a done deal. Now, even a year ago, we were a good year and a half into our message that there was not going to be a recession. The data simply didn't support that uh, in our view. And despite the fact that we had some uh, bank closures, you may remember in Q1, Silicon Valley Bank uh, was taken over by regulators, and frankly, there would have been a lot more had the Federal Reserve not established uh, the bank term funding program, whereby banks could essentially disguise some uh, assets they bought that had lost a lot of money uh, as if they had not. That that expires in March of this year, by the way. Despite those things, you know, the market just kept moving upwards 
uh, as, as we said, and we'll go over some of that data in a minute, when you've got an employment market this strong, so many people working, so many people being added to the job roles, it's pretty hard to have a recession. Uh, in fact, we ended with a headline, job openings fall to a 28-month low. Others are still clinging to the idea, very few at this point, but a few are still clinging to the idea that we're about to have a recession still because that looks like bad news, yet the employment market is so overheated. Frankly, a little bit of easing there wouldn't be a bad thing at all. So, you know, there, there's there's few folks out there still willing to call a recession. Uh, most have swung to the optimistic side about two and a half years too late, but there's still a few, and they're going to cite some statistics that, that we'll actually take as a positive. Uh, and no, we don't think there's going to be a recession. If you're not just a short-term investor, but someone that takes the longer view, and I hope that's everybody in the audience today, what you'll see is that all the major asset classes that we cover have been up over the last one year, over the last five years, and those are the annual averages that we're showing, and indeed over the last 10 years. It should remind you that there's no place we're ever going to put your money where we think it's going to go down over any reasonable period of time. These are all profit-seeking uh, asset allocation decisions that we're making on your behalf. And over the long run, as you stretch out the time frame, it's very difficult to find any down decades. Uh, certainly, if you go to 15 or 20 years, they, they pretty much uh, cease to exist. You can always find a red arrow in the short run somewhere, it would seem, although not uh, over the periods of time that we're covering here. There's maybe one other important takeaway from this slide. If you look to the bottom, look to the left, that's the U.S. stock market over the last 10 years. Just look at how those returns dwarf everything else. Now, 90 days ago, when we were doing our quarterly market report for the fourth quarter of 2023, the headline was American exceptionalism. And I reviewed a lot of the reasons that the U.S. market has done so well. So that phrase, American exceptionalism, can mean different things to different people. But from the perspective of the investor, it's been really hard to beat. Uh, investing in the U.S. market. And that's one of the reasons that we've always overweighted your allocation to the U.S. compared to the global equity indexes. So just a quick review of last year's strategy. We said stocks are maybe the best hedge in a changing world. We're worried about AI and what it means to people losing jobs and the volatility and this changing world. But, you know, if you're in equity owner, that's the secret, because if you're diversified, you're always invested in the success that capitalism, that innovation are going to bring to equity owners. It's the best way to hedge your bets in volatile times. We also said that fixed income has normalized, more or less, because inflation is falling and it's continued to fall all throughout the past year, and interest rates are up. So you can actually invest safely and make some money over and above the rate of inflation. The first time in nearly two decades that we could reliably do that. We did warn about, warn about volatility in individual stocks. And, and just to, to call maybe this one a qualified success, we were very unsure at the beginning of last year, would the stock market winners be the firms that are spending hundreds of billions of dollars in the race to develop the best AI, or would it be the users of AI, all the companies that can benefit from using these new technologies? I would liken it to how you might currently view the firms that produce laptop computers. Are they ruling the stock market, or is it all the other firms that use laptops? Is it the makers, or is it the users? I think with AI, in the long run, it's going to be the users. Just this uh, just this week, we're seeing numbers now going into the trillions for what's going to be required to stay competitive in the AI market, whereas all of us can use this technology. Some companies will use it better, some will use it worse, and that's going to continue to lead to massively different outcomes between different companies trying to compete in a given sector. Some are going to use it better, some are going to use it worse. And then lastly, we talked about private market opportunities. 
maybe given us the best time to buy that we've seen in a long time. We continue to hear some of the folks in the venture capital world say that they're finding deals that are the best they've seen in their careers. And so while we did not have a recession in the broader economy, there has been some chaos, in particular in the venture capital private market world. And so a lot of deals were done uh, for our clients this past year, even though overall deal volume shrank considerably. And they've been at what we think will turn out to be terrific prices. Like bottles of wine, venture capital investing is often referred to by its vintage. And as we look back over time, we'll see that entry points at different times have yielded dramatically different results. And I suspect that in the future, we'll look back at 2022, 23, 24 vintages where money went into private markets as producing some of the best long-term returns that we've ever seen. So we're gonna, gonna, gonna give ourselves four check boxes for 2023. Uh, again, not knowing that we didn't exactly call that the seven top tech stocks would really be the ones to lead the market, but that could come undone at any moment. So qualified success there, but four check boxes. Now, just having a quick review, and we'll move really fast through this part. This is just the normal what happened last quarter section of the presentation. So lots of data here. But let's begin with their blended benchmark results. Now, you've already seen these if you've looked at your own quarterly portfolio report that came out uh, at the end of 1231. Took us a few weeks to get all those numbers vetted, but those are out now. You can go to client care to take a look at your report. But what you'll see is that for the last three months of the year, we had terrific returns in fixed income, terrific returns in equity. <clears throat> what, what a great way to finish the year. And so the last quarter was terrific. The whole year was terrific. You know, if you look at if you look at 2023, that global equity index return, that's about two and a half years worth of what we would normally expect to get. And then finally, a great year in fixed income. You know, a couple of years ago, the returns in fixed income for the year, for the index at least, were a negative 13%. So it's really nice to have a positive year. And that's what you get when yields have finally risen and stabilized to a large degree. So another slide with green arrows that always beats the red arrows pointing down, the green arrows pointing up are, are my favorite. And while these are not record setting in terms of the best quarter that we've seen in recent memory, we did set records in what many would call the boring part of the allocation for fixed income. So again, for, for the U.S. stock market, up, up uh, 12% was great for the quarter. You know, 22% is the record. Uh, that wasn't too long ago. Uh, but look at the fixed income piece. We said fixed income is finally going to be a productive place to invest. And so for the quarter, we set new records, the best returns there in both U.S. and global fixed income indexes. Not exactly how we invest, but the indexes uh, in Q4. The U.S. stock market had terrific returns. For the quarter, small cap value did the best, and we do overweight to small cap and to value a bit, so great for air investors. Maybe the thing that should stand out even more on this page, though, is the fact that the U.S. stock market is now 61% of the global stock market. Barely 3,000 stocks out of more than 15,000, I think, at last count. And here we are at 61% of the value of the total. So if you added up the value of all the shares for companies listed in the U.S. versus companies listed everywhere, we're 61% of the total. A decade ago, we were barely over 40%, and the U.S. has simply outperformed so much for so long that now we're 61% of the total. So if you, you buy a global equity index, 61% of that is in the U.S. stock market. In international developed market stocks, that's down to 28%. We have a bit less than that uh, in those markets for you. But maybe the takeaway from this slide is that when you look in the top right quadrant there, 
the gray bars, the, the higher returns represent what U.S. dollar-based investors were able to get, and that's all of you. So foreign currency returns or local currency, as you would call it, uh, was much less, but the U.S. dollar slipped. That means the foreign currency is appreciated. So when you invest overseas, you're invested in a currency and an equity market. And so those both did well. So we got the dark gray bars, not quite as much as the U.S., but still a terrific word. It's the same story in emerging markets. We got the dark gray bars. So emerging markets have lagged for some time, but still a terrific quarter and about a year's worth of returns uh, for what we expect over the long term. Now, for those of you that regularly attend these uh, webinars or are in-person uh, quarterly market reports, you may know that I often pause on this slide for what seems like probably 10 or 15 minutes and talk about everything that's going on in the rate market. But we don't really need to do that today. Rates are up. There's a little bit of movement. There's a lot of data on this page. I've highlighted one column for you there. And the lesson I think over the last three years is that we moved a substantial part of our client's allocation and fixed income to investment vehicles that mirror the return of the three-month treasury bill index. Almost no price movement, just cranking out the return. Over the last three years, that has been the best place to be among all of these asset classes. And we made that major move three years ago and are still there today. So our clients have not had those big down years, have not had that volatility. It's been very stable. It's been very safe. And we're, we just wanted to call out that uh, uh, our clients have not experienced the kind of volatility that you might see portrayed in these tables for their fixed income allocations. All right, and now we get to get to some very interesting data that I'm gonna bet a lot of you have not seen before. The headline is exceeding our limits, and we're gonna talk about how we're beyond our limits uh, by using the term gap. And we're gonna go through all sorts of gaps um, that range from economic gaps to social gaps, and you'll see what I mean as we get into this. So let's just start with an expectations gap. And I just have to put up this chart. I don't think people would let me do a QMR or AMR without showing this. But once again, there is a huge gap between what you might hear from the financial media and what we're telling you. And there's this great bit of data that's available from the Federal Reserve Economic Database, known as FRED, that uh, shows the, the, the current expectation from this data set for a recession in the near future is 0.82%, so less than a 1% chance. And what you'll see looking back over the history of this data point is that with the exception of the pandemic that came on very, very suddenly, this, this, this gives us a little bit of warning. That probability starts to rise before we're in the recession. And so it's, it's just, it's a, it's a great piece of data to be looking at. It, it helps to give me confidence that we do not have a recession uh, in the immediate future uh, coming for the U.S. economy. So very good news there. Here's another gap to look at. This is a gap, another one that I like to show the, between uh, what we think is the best GDP position that the U.S. economy could be in, that's red, that's our potential. And in the green, which is the actual. So this is not even a recent phenomenon. We've been doing this for a while and economists will debate, how do we even get here? I like to compare this to uh, when a lot of us might have been in school and a 4.0 was the best you could get. If you got a A's, you got a 4.0. Well, if you've got kids or grandkids, you know that nowadays you can graduate high school with a 5.0, which I'm still not sure how that works when a when, when A's give you a four, but it's as if the red line was a 4.0, as good as it could be, at least as the way we uh, did grades a few decades ago, and yet the U.S. economy has a 5.0. We're in a much better, stronger position. And while there's a lot of great leaders, great countries, you know, we want to take a global view about life and about the economy, 
the U.S. has just done so much better. The entrepreneurial spirit, uh, in many cases, the freer markets, uh, who knows what else, have just contributed to this American exceptionalism in terms of return and in terms of GDP growth. And, you know, you don't hear this reported nearly enough in this political environment. It's been going on for so long, maybe it's hard for either side to claim a victory here. But it's something I think as Americans, we can all feel a little bit of joy about. Here's another gap that you'll hear about. And here's the gap. This is a graph of retail sales. The gap is what you're going to hear about this statistic. Turn on CNBC, hear the talking heads come on and talk about the growth of retail sales. And the gap is what they've been telling you for three years we were going to get and what we actually got. I wish I could put a line on here that says, here's what they said on CNBC. Uh, you know, two dozen different people that came on and said that we weren't going to get this kind of result. One of the big reasons why that you're, you will hear cited is this idea that there was a lot of stimulus during the time of the pandemic. A lot of it went to businesses. A lot of it went to individuals. There was stimulus everywhere, but guess what? It's all been spent, so retail sales are going to fall. Well, if you're one of the 70% of American families that own your own home, what does your balance sheet look like right now? Your home may have gone up 40% in price in the last five years. If you look at your overall balance sheet, which is how a lot of Americans will think, not just how much do I have in the bank, your balance sheet looks great. Your net worth is perhaps the biggest that it's ever been. You just can't believe it. For most Americans, their house is their biggest asset. They look at that and they feel terrific. So there is a freedom to spend from that. Plus, of course, the employment market is incredibly strong. We'll cover that here in a moment. So retail sales should continue to go up. And they've gone up at a rate that's faster than has happened before. But these are unique times. And so, again, the folks that you hear about just tell you have been telling you this wasn't going to happen. We've been telling you it was. And here we are. I keep talking about the job market. We're going to talk about several gaps in employment. And this is actually a graph of unemployment. Well, how low could it get? What is the natural rate of unemployment? Below which it's very hard for an economy to go to for, for, for very long at all. That, that's the blue line, the natural rate. Now, repeatedly throughout our history, we've gotten below that. Let's think about what was happening there, though. Every time you see it go below that, we end up in a recession in the months or years that follow. Why would that be? Maybe a cut because the economy was going very strong and then the Federal Reserve began to raise interest rates. We're growing too fast, let's raise interest rates. They have a really bad habit of overshooting. That's not the position we're in. The Fed is talking about lowering rates. Most analysts expect anywhere between two and five interest rate decreases this year. I'm probably closer to the two than the five. So now we might actually have the Federal Reserve lowering the overnight rate at a time when the employment market is great. That's not really the recipe for a recession in my book. So we're outperforming yet again. There's a gap between how good we thought the news could be and how good the news actually is, which is to say, terrific. A statistic that relates to the one we just showed was what we'll call the participation rate. And we've covered this quarter after quarter. It's just really important for people to understand. So we're going to cover it again. And that's this. The red line is the participation rate we thought we'd get. In other words, of all the eligible adults out there, how many choose to participate in the labor market? So we've known for decades the red line was going to go down. I mean, how many 70, 80, 90-year-olds and up from there, do we really expect to choose to participate in the labor market? There's a lot more of those folks than there used to be. So we knew that the participation rate go down. Birth rates are down. People are living longer. We're going to see this number decline. What you want to look at is the black line and how far above the expected line it is. Now, four years ago, we were in a similar situation. And then the pandemic hit us 
and crush that. But we have fought our way back. In fact, if you look at this graph, you could argue that where we're at above the red line is as high as it's ever been. Now, again, when we got there into a similar situation before, we were often met with a recession. The pandemic is what we would call an external shock. In other situations, we hit a recession, but we also had the Fed deciding to fight the level of growth and the good news that we were seeing. And it doesn't look like they're going to be doing that anymore. They've been fighting us for the last uh, year and a half hour after finally getting on board with raising rates to combat inflation. But we've done this anyway. So again, it's just hard to imagine a labor market any stronger. One other thing to think about, a lot more people can work from home now. A lot more people can be, be mobile. Maybe they're in a coffee shop, they're in a remote location, they're working from home, wherever. That flexibility, that opportunity for people to contribute to the, to the workforce productivity with a different way of working may mean that the, the red line just is underestimating where we could be. And the black line might even continue to rise above the red line because of more flexible work arrangements. So I don't think we should assume that it's going to come crashing back down, given the position of the Fed and given that there's now a new way to work that we've never really seen at this kind of scale ever before. Maybe we'll just have to start to move, move the red line up to realize just how many people can now participate. And so if you add up all these employment gaps, again, we're, we're exceeding where we thought we could be in so many ways. Maybe it's informative to look at who was in the White House over the history of all this. You know, I think it can be a really uh, a big mistake to, to read too much into the political tea leaves and uh, who was in the White House, who was in Congress might be even more important. But, you know, it's an election year, so I put this up. Uh, if somebody's trying to create a political narrative around when it's done better or done worse, I don't think that that's possible. Again, I think that what the Federal Reserve was doing uh, in the case of the pandemic, the economic shock that we experienced really tell the story better. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to get into a few possible economic shocks that we at least want to be aware could be happening this year. Here's another gap that's really important, especially in an election season. We call it the wealth gap. What we're doing here is we're taking the U.S. population and we're dividing it into quintiles, fifths, 20%, 20%, and so on. And if you look at the total wealth owned by the bottom 20%, it's pretty small compared to the top. I mean, what a difference. So the wealth gap is real. Different parts of America experience America differently. Um, some say they've given up on the American dream. Now, if you have capitalism, you get this. If you have a meritocracy, you get this. Not that capitalism is necessarily a meritocracy in all senses of the word. What's odd is you can look at wealth gaps in countries attempting to be communist or socialist, and you actually get that there too, often because there's so much graft and corruption at the higher levels that you still get gigantic disparities between the bottom and the top, despite the intent of those economic systems. So we do expect to see this, but it's worth looking at the data and being aware. This leads, as I said before, to very different experiences in America. And this could lead to discontent. This can lead to unexpected election outcomes. This feeds into a lot of the other narrative that you hear and can contribute to volatility because generally speaking, if you're not just in the bottom 20, but maybe the bottom 60%, you're looking at what you see at the top and maybe a little uneasy or unhappy about that. Now, one truism uh, about the American experience is that we all want or even think that we can get to the top. And there's a long history of that. In fact, many of the folks in the top 1% definitely did not start there. You know, they invented a new technology in their dorm room at college or something, and that's what got them there. So the expectation of mobility is part of that American dream. But when you hear that people have, that don't believe in that anymore, th those are the signs that, that, that uh, trouble is brewing. 
Another way of expressing the wealth gap is based on the level of educational achievement. I'm not surprised to see that the average wealth of somebody that has a college degree is so much higher. It, that persistent gap there is one of the reasons that college tuition continues to climb at rates well above generalized inflation. What I'm a little surprised to see is how close it is with a high school degree and some college. One of the things that you hear about is that when people go to college but don't graduate, they don't tend to get the future earnings that college graduates get, but they still might walk out of college after two or three years with a lot of college debt. And I think that burden might be part of what's being reflected here. And of course, uh, relieving college debt has been in the news. There's really, there's really no such thing as transferring debt or transferring or, or eliminating debt. You really, you're just transferring it to somebody else. But you know what's happening is much of the um, college debt relief. Uh, that that tax burden has been transferred to those that did get a college degree. But you see, again, a very different American experience based on that level of educational uh, attainment. And it's just worth knowing what that looks like. We can also see that by race. Now, there's other charts that might break down 15 different racial backgrounds uh, or, or country origins for people living in the United States. And, and uh, you know, that gets very interesting as you get more granular. But if you think in terms of the electoral process, the fact that we're in an election year, these are the broad categories that get looked at the most. And again, these are just averages, but very different experiences. And then what I think is one of the very interesting charts, because we're in unique times here, too, this is the housing gap, housing affordability. Let me explain this, this chart. When you see the green line and you see that it's over 100 percent, here's what that means. That means a family of the median income, that's the income in the middle, not the average, but right in the middle, can afford the median priced house. So the house price that's in the middle um, and the family in the middle are great two pieces of data to compare. And for much of what we're graphing here over the last few decades, where the line is green, the family of median income could more than afford the house of median price, but not now. That number has shrunk dramatically, dramatically. So uh, that's just not the case anymore. There's a big gap there. So if you're one of the 70% of American families that own a home, and it's slightly less than 70, terrific. This housing inflation is fantastic. If you're in the 30, vastly different experience because you're forced to rent. Couple that with some of the big pools of money from Wall Street, which is a, a very general term. Nobody quite knows even what that means anymore, but big pools of capital that are buying up single family housing and pushing that to the rental market. Now, now young families aren't locking in that, that asset anymore. They're forced to rent and may be forced to rent for a long, long time. Their housing cost continues to go up. Whereas if you own the home, it does not. So again, vastly different experiences if you're not part of that 70% that owns a home. Now the next slide will give you some of the main reasons why housing has become less affordable the green bars at the top are income, so rising incomes have helped. But price changes have hurt, and price changes happen because materials are more expensive, labor's more expensive. But what's really hurt so much lately has been higher interest rates. And it's kind of funny because the chairman of the Fed has argued that uh, he's unhappy that houses have gone up in price, and in his effort to fight overall inflation, he wanted to raise interest rates, I think too high and for too long already, yet that's hurt housing. So we're getting mixed messages there, and he's really on the hot seat for this one. So um, when interest rates are high, housing is less affordable, and, and that's a real problem. So we don't have any great solutions for this, except I'll offer this. When housing prices are high, generally it will pull new 
suppliers, new builders into the market to build more housing. That's what capitalism does. When there's a profit motive out there and there's profit to be made, you get new entrants into the market and that brings the price down. And that's exactly what these giant pools of capital from Wall Street are trying to prevent from happening. They're grabbing up this inventory. They're pushing it to the rental market so that it doesn't bring housing prices down. That's that's sort of the harsh side of capitalism, if you will. Now, there's multiple bills out there in front of Congress to create a financial penalty, uh, a surcharge, whatever you want to call it, for firms doing this, or just to prohibit it outright to deal with this. But it is a very big issue for younger folks and folks maybe even in the bottom uh, uh, bottom 60% uh, of wealth. If you're in the market for a new house, you just might not be able to afford it. Now, here's an interesting piece of data. And if you're hearing about proposals to deal with Social Security, this is why this is important. This is a graph of life expectancy based on average income. And here's the takeaways. The gap in life expectancy for a man in the top 1% of income versus the bottom 1% of income is nearly 15 years. A lot of folks don't know that. For women, it's closer to 10. Now, why do people end up in the bottom? Sometimes there's health issues, drug abuse issues, mental health issues. There's lots of reasons somebody can find themselves in the bottom. Sometimes it's just bad luck, lack of educational achievement, other things that put folks there. But what a different experience, a 15 year life expectancy gap for men and 10 for women. Men at the bottom tend to have some of the most dangerous jobs and more likely to get injured or killed. So that, again, there's a lot that goes into this. You might also note that at the very top levels, the life expectancy gap between men and women is just a couple of years. We always hear eight. That's for the average at the top. It shrinks. It almost comes together. So the gap is bigger between men and women at the bottom, smaller at the top. Income is one of the best predictors of life expectancy. Access to healthcare, more knowledge, uh, better choices, a lot of things tend to go into that. Well, here's how that plays out for Social Security. Social Security is always thought of as being a very progressive tax system. A progressive tax system. The more you have to put into Social Security, the worse your deal is per dollar contributed. And that's true up to about the $160,000 cap, I think it is, in 2024, after which your income no longer is uh, taxed for Social Security purposes. But you know what? If you live a lot longer, you've got a lot more years of draw. And what's funny is you can read about this from the Social Security trustees. And what you learn is that the Social Security tax system is not all that progressive. It's not quite flat, but it's a lot flatter than we might think. So when you're hearing of political solutions, of tax solutions for Social Security, know that the people behind those solutions are probably aware of this. I don't hear this talked about very much by politicians. Maybe people just don't want to be the one to deliver the message that there's this big of a gap, but it is a huge gap. And that's what you need to know when you start to hear about uh, changes to the Social Security uh, taxation program. Okay, now this is interesting, and I'm going to move quickly through the last part of the presentation here. But this is actually the slide from last year. And note that in the worst case scenario, and the red line is the one to look at. The red line is not what's legislated. The red line is where we all think we're going to end up with. It's the ratio of the size of our national debt to the size of our economy. A year ago, we looked at 10 years and it was going to go to 138%. Now it's only going to go to 130. And that's still bad news. But this is maybe one of the best pieces of bad news I've ever been able to deliver. The future is not nearly as bad as we thought it was going to be. And again, the way these charts work is the bottom line is what's legislated. The top line is where we're going to what we're going to actually go, meaning tax cuts that are going to going to sunset probably aren't. And, you know, we're, we're going to continue to spend more money than we should. But again, the good news there is that the 10 year projection a year ago was we were going to get to the debt being 138 percent of the size of the economy. Now that's down to 130. And that's actually how I ended the presentation last year, where I said, Hey, all this economic growth could do really good stuff for us. That's okay. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so uh, here's a, a great uh, a great gap, and 
I don't know if the sound is going to come through on this presentation or not, even if it's just the video, uh, that's fine. But uh, uh, here's the message on this. And Nate, I think if you click the, yeah. So we're just going to see this caption. All right. So here's the story. Um, I've got a son. He's starting to get into calculus. He's at that age. He's a teenager. And, you know, it's tough as a, as a parent and you're trying to guide your, your child through calculus. I, I need about 10 minutes to go refresh my own memory. Turns out, look at this, Kim Kardashian and none other than Taylor Swift know all about calculus. So if you need to teach your child about calculus, you can have uh, Kim and Taylor do the teaching. Or there's actually ones out there with Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama teaching calculus as well. You can you can pick uh, who you think your uh, who you think your teenager is more receptive to, right? How about that? And and when you watch these things, you believe that they're real. It's really just amazing to see. So there was a recent example, you may have heard about this, where Taylor Swift's uh, image and, and likeness was uh, falsely, uh, in, in a deep fake video, pulled into a scam with La Croissant uh, French cookware. And she's known to use that and love that. And it's, it's, it's great stuff and very expensive. And the scam was put out there where people were baited into uh, watching and clicking on this scam and defrauded because they believed that uh, Taylor Swift was going to give away 20 piece cookware sets. I mean, oh my gosh, why would you believe that? But the fake was so good. What am I getting at here? I'm calling it the honesty gap. We have entered a new era, folks. We cannot believe what we see. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you a story here. Just this week, a news item came out that in Hong Kong, uh, someone working in the finance department of a multinational corporation was called into a video chat. CFO was there. Department leaders were there. He was convinced that he needed to send out $25 million in cash for some corporate purpose, and it was all fake. This is a new risk. We've simply never seen anything like it before. In fact, in May of last year, and we can go to the next slide here, there was this report that came out. We're not going to play the audio here or sit through all of this. There was a fake image that was put out. This was in May of 2023, suggested there was an explosion near, near uh, the Pentagon. It was all fake. Russian social media picked it up. And in an instant, the U.S. stock market lost $100 billion in value. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was an image that the Eiffel Tower was on fire and people believed that too. So this is where we're going. Again, I'm calling it the honesty gap, but we are going to rapidly lose our reference points for what's real and what's not. We're going to be bombarded, I suspect, not just with attempts to hack our own wallets, take money from us, false political imagery, attempts to manipulate the capital markets, all sorts of stuff. And, and where do we go for the truth? Is it Wikipedia? Is it Google? Who can we trust to tell us what's right? Well, not Twitter. I mean, Twitter was amplifying all of this kind of stuff and anybody can get a, a verified Twitter handle these days. So we're going to have to sort all this out. But it presents a, a kind of an existential risk to all of us, to our investing, to our political process, and we just do not know what the solution is going to be. Uh, but go back and Google that if you want to read all the details about, uh, you know, what happened in May of, of 2023. So what are our predictions for 2024? Well, maybe no surprise. I'm super enthusiastic about the economy, as you've heard already. But I think it would be very easy for there to be a domestic political crisis that can test the markets. Who's, who was legitimately elected to be the president? What if there's fake videos out there of, you know, something happens to one of the presidential candidates? Um, who knows what else we could be uh, uh, defrauded with in our political process as a result of these new AI tools? So great economy, but these kind of things can overwhelm the good news in the markets very quickly. And as the divisions within the U.S. are widening and we're fighting each other, it also makes us vulnerable on the global stage. 
because geopolitical shocks can also test the markets. And in fact, the global power order is being changed as we speak. You know, our proxy war in Ukraine has cost the Russians dearly. They don't seem to want to pull out, but it is costing them. Their military is being degraded. Vladimir Putin is at significantly higher political risk than he ever was. China is a mess. China, China is in a, in a mess at a scale that is probably far bigger than we were through our own Great Recession. But a lot of the data is being covered up. The amount of bad debt that is behind real estate development in China is, is gargantuan. I just don't know how to use, use bigger words than that, right? And so the government is doing what, it's can, what, what it can, but this is not over. Uh, the Chinese government is applying stimulus on the scale of trillions of dollars. They are going to try to outrun this, but I'm not convinced they're going to be able to. And so this was supposed to be the Chinese century. If you remember back a few decades, that is not turning out to be the case. The U.S. economy is, is leaping ahead of China. China is not going to catch the U.S. anytime soon, as far as we can tell. In fact, we may find ourselves where the Chinese economy is actually shrinking rapidly as they kind of try to come to grips with all of this uh, debt that is now in default and it's not going to get better soon. So as, as the global power system gets reordered, that presents all sorts of risk for desperate uh, uh, measures being taken. Uh, let's not even get into the Middle East and all the things that are going on there. And I think the real risk for all of us is this. We become weak domestically because of the way we're fighting each other. And then if there's a new leader in China, a new leader in Russia, again, let's, let's think about the Middle East as well. It's the perfect time for, I don't know, China to take Taiwan, for other things to happen right there, because there's maybe someone new in a position of power and they see that we're vulnerable because of what we're doing to ourselves. So this can happen. It's happened before. It can happen again. It could be worse than before and it could overwhelm all the good news that we're seeing. We're not going to forget about massive disruptions with individual stocks because of what's happening with AI and more or less competitive uh, companies out there. And okay, that's all very scary, right? That sounds like a whole bunch of bad things that could go wrong. And it's true. I hope in a year we're not reviewing all those and talking about what did, but let's not forget some other great things that are happening. Once again, we're looking at the private markets to talk about it, there are new ways to invest. I'm sure your advisor is talking to you about them, but there are new vehicle types where you can put money in when you want to put money in. You should be able to pull money out when you want to pull money out. It's, it's much more manageable. The innovation taking place within this part of the investment landscape is absolutely massive. Talk to your advisor. It's absolutely a game changer. And we're going to be pioneers in bringing this to, to our investors and, and I think continue to be way ahead of our competition. So just a quick reminder, this, this is our toolbox, right? We're not going to go into every bit of this today. We've talked about this before. Our advisors have so many more tools to do good things for you than, than other firms have been able to, to, uh, to come up with. But let's talk, talk about a particular scenario. What if you're, you've heard all this stuff I've said and you're the risk-averse investor? Well, Maybe only certain parts of the toolbox are right for you, the, the things on the less risky end, right? Now, on the far end, maybe you've got a lot in one stock. We've got an option strategy that tries to cut that volatility in half. So that's why that's why that's on there. If you've got too much in one stock, we can help you there too. But what if you just want some of the in, in safer investments? Well, BIP short-term tactical is one of these strategies we've come up with that's investing at the 90-day treasury yield. So we're well north of 5% with almost no volatility because it's treasuries. We're not even so concerned about FDIC limits. We've got clients with millions in that. Or maybe it's private fixed income. You know, pretty much all of our private fixed income is cranking out yields in the 12% range or better. You can't really find that in the public stock market. In fact, we could come in and look at just the tools on the lower end of the risk spectrum here and engineer an expected return of 9% pretty easily. Why do I say 9%? Well, 9% is the expected return if you put 100% of your assets in the public stock market. 
And we know what that kind of volatility looks like. You really got to be ready for volatility if you're a 100% stock market investor. And yet we could engineer the same expected return at what I would think would be significantly lower risk to you. So you're the risk averse investor. We got some great things we can do for you. Now, what if you're not the risk averse investor? You're that long-term investor. You know, you're, you're not scared by some of this stuff. Well, you still might want some short-term tactical. You're waiting for your next capital call into private equity. You, you at least want to make better than 5% there, right? We can certainly do that right now. Private fixed income of 12% sounds in, in a range you might be interested in talking about. It's hard to walk away from that. But as we get up the other end of the private equity, you know, I love it when I get to do this presentation in person and we're sitting there at dinner and one of our longtime clients can share with a new client what their returns have been like in private equity. These new clients are just blown away. They just can't even believe how high that's been. We, we get nervous about quoting those numbers that we've seen, but you know, when we bring a specific deal to you, we're able to talk about what that looks like. Let's just say it's significantly more ambitious than what we think we could get in the public stock market alone. So, hey, if you're in it for the long term and you're ready to look at some of the chaos out there as a buying opportunity, we got you covered there. Or you know what? Maybe you're just in the middle somewhere. We can do that too. So one last reminder, and then we'll wrap up here. What if you don't want all that complexity? What if you're just keeping it simple? What if you've got public fixed income and public equity? What's still the core portfolio for most people? What's the lesson here? Just remember this in this webinar. Volatility is your friend. If you're a 50-50 investor, 50% 50 equity, 50% fixed income, do you want the next decade to be calm or volatile? Well, the answer is you want it to be volatile. You want lots of ups, lots of downs, because when the market goes up, we sell some equity. When the market dips back down, we buy some. The market goes up again, we sell some. The market goes back down, we buy some. You will make more money with a volatile path forward than a calm path forward. So just keep that in mind. And I think a lot of our clients have embraced that already. The last big downturn in the equity markets, like really big after the pandemic, we had clients calling us every day. Is it time to step in? Is it time to step in? Is it time to put more money into equity markets? And eventually it was, and we did. And they've certainly benefited from that. So we won't pause on this slide here because that's just a summary of everything I just said. But uh, let's go to the question slide. And uh, I say this tongue in cheek. I swear these images are all real. Donald and Joe are best friends. They go for walks. They bake together. No, you can you can see the disclosure at the bottom there, Bill. This is absolutely fake. But you know what? If we're going to show a bunch of uh, of fakes from AI here, why not uh, why not end on a positive note? Nice job, Eric. Nice job. Uh, we appreciate all what you guys do for for BIP. Thank you. Thanks, folks.